Hello all. This is Wegaf Reviews. I am the Wegaf, and this is our first two-part episode! Yes, yes, I know, it's technically our second, but that last one became a two-parter through necessity. It stretched too long. This one was designed as such from the beginning. Why so? Well, first, the story is a little long, although we've had longer before, but mainly because, um, fair warning, the introduction here is going to stretch things out a bit. It's long, but it kind of needs to be long. Why? Well, it has to do with our word of the day, or days, rather. It's a loaded word, and that word is racism. Yeah, there's not going to be any music under this one. Back in the Golden Age, as you probably know, there was a lot of racial, social, and ethnic stereotyping in comics and just about everywhere else. Some of it was fairly mild, but some of it was bad stuff. I mean, truly bigoted, horrible stuff. Now, I have carefully avoided this sort of thing up till now because People tend to be sensitive about it, and I didn't want to scare anyone off, so I pitched softballs so far. But I can't just keep on doing that. For one thing, it would not be true to the material. I mean, this stuff was everywhere. You couldn't escape it. Every comic featured it now and again when it wasn't doing so often and repeatedly. I would be cutting myself off from a huge huge amount of stories, some of them otherwise very good, and presenting a sanitized, censored version of the era in the process. I would be spoon-feeding you pablum, and that, to me, is far more offensive than anything I would be shielding you from. I respect your intelligence, and I'm not going to treat you like a bunch of milksops. Also, there's a broad spectrum when it comes to this sort of thing. Some very talented creators indulged in stereotyping because, again, everybody did it to some degree. It was part of popular culture. As such, any devotee of Golden Age comics, which I am, cannot be thin-skinned when it comes to reading them, and must learn to differentiate between genuine, skin-crawling bigotry and relatively innocent indulgence and stuff that wouldn't fly nowadays because times moved on. As you may have gathered, I have quite a lot to say on this subject, and I hope at some point I'll be able to talk about it further. But not here. I don't want to stop and give a lecture every time I encounter a stereotype. First off, it'd slow things down immensely, and second, it'd be boring. I'd be repeating myself all the time. If I can't say it concisely, I don't want to talk about it. At least, not more than once. What I need, therefore, for both your benefit and mine, is a sort of audio-visual shorthand to help me give my opinion, give it quickly, and move on. And thanks to the wonders of modern technology, I have just that! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I present to you the Bigotrometer 5000! Now, this thing is pretty simple. As you can see, it's set up like a stoplight. Green, yellow, red, go, slow, stop, right? In this case, go means whatever it is is pretty mild. Not something you could get away with nowadays, but nothing too bad. It gets a pass. Slow is a bit worse than that, the comic's shying into dangerous territory. It's middling, because it's in the middle, but it doesn't get a pass, it gets a watch yourself, buster. <laughs> and finally we come to red, which is the bad stuff. The really bad stuff. The full-on, no-holds-barred, hugely offensive, hide-the-women-and-children, I-do-not-approve-sir-you-watch-out-your-filthy-mouth bad stuff. So, mild. Medium. Bad. And now, to show the Bigotrometer 5000 in practice, let's finally move on to the main event, where we will have all sorts of opportunities to see it in its full glory.
a quick but necessary sub-intro here. This is actually the earliest comic I've reviewed so far, coming out in 1937, which purists might say would put it beyond this show's purview, since apparently the Golden Age only started with the introduction of Superman in 38, which would therefore make this one part of what some call the Platinum Age. One, I don't care, it's still the 30s and that's good enough for me. And two, this story is a little piece of history that is very relevant not just to this show, but to comics in general. First, it came out in Detective Comics number one, the very first DC comic to truly deserve the name, and second, it was cobbled together by a pair you may have heard of, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, the creators of Superman! Their very first important creation, Doctor Occult, had come out just two years earlier and was more akin to a comic strip than a comic book character. This was their sophomore effort, and introduced a character who is still around today, Slam Bradley, who you may have heard of, but I'll let him introduce himself. Slam Bradley, everyone! Incidentally, this also marks our very first non-superhero story, so variety! Yay! We open on Slam Bradley himself, as he... Ah, uh, well, this is a good start. In the hidden catacomb under the streets of Chinatown, Slam Bradley, a freelance sleuth fighter and adventurer, is entangling with a mob of celestials who resent his investigating. No, not those. Apparently it's an old term for Chinese people that nobody uses anymore. I don't think it's a pejorative, just very outdated. Knives flash, fists fly! Although outnumbered, Slam is having a swell time! So you want to play, eh? I'm a little torn here. On the one hand, Slam is clearly a roughhouser of the old school type. The COME ON FELLERS LET'S MUSS em UP! WAHOO! sort of guy. And that's always fun. It's less fun when the people he's roughhousing with are... well, these. First panel and he's beating up a bunch of random Asian dudes. This does not bode well. <laughs> Suddenly a locked door crashes inward before the charge of a swarm of bluecoats! Hey, what's the idea of busting in on a private fight? Oh, we just came in to see a show off. Sergeant Kelly, if I wasn't having such a good time, I'd pop your one into snoot! Slam Bradley, a man with priorities! Entirely shallow priorities, but still priorities. So, with the help of the boys in blue, he mops up the... gang, I suppose, in no time flat. And in case you're wondering, no, we never find out why they're there, why Slam's there, or what he was investigating in the first place. Quality! I suppose I should thank you for practically saving my life. What do you mean, practically? Why, if it hadn't been for us, Slam Bradley is not big on gratitude, apparently. Anyway, it turns out that the sergeant's boss, one Captain Frawley, wants to talk to him about a special case. So off they go to headquarters, where someone else is also waiting. Shorty Morgan, would-be detective who admires Slam almost to idolation! Now that word was not familiar to me, so I looked it up. It's not in this dictionary. Or in this one. It is, however, in this dictionary, the Urban Dictionary. Idolation, and I quote, to isolate oneself completely from all social and media interaction because you recorded American Idol and have yet to watch the results. I'm pretty sure that's not what Siegel was going for. Who admires Slam almost to idolation greets Bradley at headquarters. Could you use a good assistant? Aside, right? For the hundredth time, no! Tact is also not one of Slam Bradley's strong suits. Slam, I want you to meet Rita Carlyle, daughter of the Carlyle chain store owner. She'll tell you her story herself. Don't mind my torn shirt, lady. This is a special occasion. The first time I ever met a dime store princess. Politeness is also not one of Slam Bradley's strong suits. Does this man have any strong suits? Because going by what I've seen so far, they're all made of lint. Must make funerals awkward. 
Meanwhile, Shorty explains his plans to the telephone girl. You see, it's like this. I've taken a mail-order course in scientific crime detection. Now, if I was Slam's partner, he'd always have science at his fingertips. Yeah, but then he'd have you, too. Oh, burn! Take that, you... 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 short person. Seriously, why does he want to be Slam's partner so badly anyway? Does he enjoy getting used for a human basketball? Because all evidence suggests that that's what his major duties would be. Anyway, meanwhile, meanwhile, back to Slam, who is listening to Rita Carlyle's story. I own a very valuable poodle dog, which I'm going to enter in a contest soon. Meanwhile, I want someone, perhaps you, to guard it and see that it comes to no harm. Ooh, this is going to get loud. Jump and blow blazes! Is this what I was dragged out of a good fight for? But you'll be well paid! There isn't money enough in the world to make me play a poodle's nursemaid! Give the job to the captain, it's more in his line! I'm a manly man, concerned! I ain't gonna be settled with no frilly, fluffy, poofy, puffy, wussy, sissy, pinky, prissy, namby, pamby, putty dog! You're dumb and I don't like you! Well, as you might imagine, that damn star princess, as Slam so rudely put it, is not going to take kindly to that sort of talk, and she tries her best to get him fired, but the captain points out that that's impossible since he's a freelancer and isn't working for anyone right now. After she's left, Slam rakes Frolly over the coals for a bit, and then exits stage right, no doubt planning to bathe in beer and bear sweat until the girl cooties have been washed away. But before he does that, he's got to deal with a certain wannabe partner. Slam! Please listen! With my scientific training and your- Bait it, shrimp! No! Wait, I said something. I've at last located a job that'll fit you perfectly. I've got a fishing trip planned and I'm short of bait. If you can hold your breath and make a noise like a worm, I just might take you along. No, actually, he passes the buck to Shorty and gives him the guarding the poodle case. Although, he doesn't actually say as much, just gives him his card and an address. Shorty, of course, is overjoyed. Yee! At last! I'm a success! Left. This is not a man with very high standards. And no, that wasn't a short joke. Meanwhile, at stately Carlisle Manor, the uh, townhouse, Rita is still more than somewhat piqued. Of all the conceited, egotistical, arrogant fools, that Slam Bradley is the worst! I'm right with you, sister. Actually, I'd replace fool with blowhard, but that's just me. So when she gets Slam's card, she's naturally a bit surprised to see Shorty holding it. But he is full of vim and vigor, and heck, any detective is better than nothing. Well, lady, I'm ready. What great mystery do you want me to solve? You will guard my dog and see it comes to no harm. <laughs> And to think I spent good money on a scientific crime detection course. Yeah, well, I think you got ripped off there, shorty my boy, because if that course was any good, you might have noticed one pertinent detail. That's not a poodle! Okay, no one has mentioned poodles to him that we've seen, but I have to assume that they did, because every time this dog has been referred to so far, it's been as a poodle. I'm not sure what type of dog that is, but it's certainly not a poodle. How do you not know what a poodle looks like, Joe Schuster? It's one of the most recognizable dogs in the world. It's like if I went, this is an apple. Well, one way or another, Shorty's stuck babysitting the furball. Taking the dog out for an airing is dangerous, but I'm sure you'll guard Mimi well. I couldn't lose her if I tried. She sticks closer to me than my vaccination. All right. Fair's fair. That's a good line. Still, this happy ideal can't last for long. Better not go in, Miss Carlyle. This is the toughest part of Chinatown. Don't worry. I can take care of myself, and I simply must own that lovely antique in the window. And so she goes in, gets herself a beautiful Ming vase, and departs. Right? Right? Well, in a sane universe, yes, but this is Slam Bradley world. 
Say, she's been in there almost an hour. I'm going to go in and see what's keeping her. He almost doesn't, though, because of the scary Chinese man on the sidewalk. You know what? This is really only implicitly racist. I've seen much worse. But I tell you, I saw Miss Carlyle walking here. Very sorry, no see Missy, you scam. And here it is. Let's see now, bad teeth, wrong accent. Oh, I knew we'd run into that one sooner or later. Bad English, shifty demeanor. Is there anything about this guy that isn't racist? Shorty frantically phone slam from a nearby store. You heard me. She walked in and poof, she disappeared. You bonehead, why did you let her enter? Wait for me, I'll be right down. Everyone knows that you can't let a woman do anything herself. Why, they're like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> bull in a china shop. Get it? Uh, yes, I get it, Slam. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. <laughs> Bull in a china shop! Woo! I'm on fire! <laughs> <laughs> you can stop laughing now, Slam. No! This is the place! Yeah? Well, follow me! We'll find that girl if we have to tear the joint down piece by piece! Go quickly. Inform the master that Slam Bradley is about to enter. And he does. Next week. I'll admit that this first part has been a little tame so far. I promised you something that would really put the bigotrometer through its paces, and so far we've gotten... But remember, this is only the setup for the second half, and it is something special. Not good special, but special. Stay tuned! Oh.